Good morning, and welcome to Living Word Bible Church. My name is Bob Grass. I'm the pastor, and I am glad that you've joined us for our online service today. If you come regularly by technology, please leave us a comment in the feeds or like the feed so that we know you're out there. And then especially if you are new to our church, maybe you just happened upon this this morning, we welcome you and we'd love to meet you sometime in person, but at least know that you're there. If you would leave a comment in the feed or else if you'd prefer to private message us just to let us know that you dropped by today, we would appreciate knowing that. We are going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Genesis. So I would encourage you to get a Bible, grab a phone, a tablet, find Genesis chapter 19. That is where we are today. More than any other catastrophe recorded in history, certainly in the Bible, we associate Sodom and Gomorrah with God's judgment. And that's where we have come to in the book of Genesis. The idea that God will judge and the assurance that there is future judgment coming on wickedness in the world. As we saw last week, God promised to Abraham that if there were 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, that he would not destroy the cities. We find out from today that he did destroy them, which means that there were not even 10 righteous people, those who had put their faith in a coming Savior to have their sins forgiven. In many ways, though, this chapter is not so much about Sodom and Gomorrah and judgment, although that is a main theme. You could also look at this chapter as being very much about Lot, that he is the main character of it. And that's the way I intend to discuss it today. Some have pointed out that this chapter records Lot's spiritual decline that has been happening all along, but particularly at this point. And I would like to share with you a brief quote from Warren Wearsby. He said that Abraham was the friend of God, and we've talked about that in past weeks, but Lot was the friend of the world. And we're going to see that today, how Lot had become a friend of the world. He was enamored with the world. And what Warren Wiersbe is referring to there is James chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We can't have it both ways. We can't be in close fellowship with the world around us and the world system and be in close fellowship with God. There's another way we could say this, and that is that Abraham loved God, but Lot loved the world. And I'd like to share a verse that has to do with that as well. 1 John 2.15 gives us a command. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So before we launch into this passage today, I have a quick warning to parents. If I were a parent tuning into this, I would want to know that we are covering a chapter that includes a discussion of homosexuality, rape, and incest. So I'll leave it to your good judgment on whether your younger children should be watching this particular sermon or not. And you can be prepared for any questions that you may get if you do. But then I'd like to give another warning to all of us. If we study this passage together this morning, and you leave with a sense of self-righteousness, patting yourself on the back, congratulating yourself that, well, I don't struggle with those sins, then you have missed the point entirely. This passage is a vivid reminder of God's judgment on sin and his mercy on sinners. And that includes all of us. And this passage is also an important lesson about the effect of being a believer, but living like the world. So we're going to approach it that way. And often I read the entire passage for us, but because it's such a long passage, we're going to wait and work through it verse by verse. But before we do that, would you pray with me, please? Our Lord and God, we know that all scripture is given by you, is inspired, breathed out by you, and that it is profitable for reproof, for instruction, 
for correction in righteousness, that it has been given so that we can be equipped for good works. And so we pray, Lord, as we study this passage today, one that is ugly, one that exposes human sin and depravity, that you, by the help of your Holy Spirit, would show us again our need for your salvation, our need to be different from the world around us, our need to share the good news with others around us. God, the Holy Spirit, would you speak through me this morning and would you pinpoint in each of our lives what we need to change, anything that we need to stop doing, anything that we need to start doing to be more like Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. I'd like to begin by offering you an outline of this passage. The chapter has 38 verses and the first 11 of them have to do with the depravity of Sodom. The depravity, that means the sinfulness of Sodom, verses 1 through 11. Second, we're going to look at the destruction of Sodom and what was going on just prior to it and just after it. Verses 12 through 29 record for us the destruction of Sodom. And then number three, the descendants of Lot. What became of Lot? What became of his children? That's verses 30 through 38. So the depravity of Sodom, the destruction of Sodom, and the descendants of Lot gives you an outline of where we're headed. But in addition to that, I would like to give you some main points, some thoughts I'd like you to take with you as a result of studying this together today. First off, God judges sin. You can use that first main point in the same verses, verses 1 through 11. God judges sin. But let's also remember that even though God judges sin, God extends mercy. That's number two. God extends mercy. Verses 12 to 29. And then third, an application to Lot and his family and to us. Loving the world may cost you your family. And we'll see that it cost him his wife in verse 26 and then his daughters in verses 30 through 38. Loving the world may cost you your family. With that in mind, let's go to this first main point of God judges sin. Look with me at Genesis 19, verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn in to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet, that you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. And he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. It talks about two angels. These are two of the three men who came and spoke with Abraham earlier in the same day. We should probably understand that as well. From the beginning of Genesis chapter 18 to the end of Genesis, almost the end of chapter 19, it's all taking place in less than 24 hours. So lunch was with Abraham, supper for the two angels who went on was with Lot. He was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And if you're like me, you read gate. Okay, there, there's this door type structure that swings on hinges. And that's true, but that's not what the gate of a city meant to them at that time. Instead, the gateway of the city was a meeting place. That's where city officials came and conducted official business. And it was a place of authority. It was a place of status. So evidently, Lot either held a position or was closely associated with people who held positions of leadership there in Sodom. Psalm 1, verse 1, would have applied to Lot if he had had it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He had become part of their system. He was a prominent citizen, it seems, of the city of Sodom. And that's important to our story as we get into it. How had he gotten to this point? Well, back in chapter 13, we read that Abraham gave him the choice and he had looked toward Sodom. He looked at it. 
And then he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then in chapter 14, he moved into Sodom. What's the answer? How did he get there? He arrived there one step at a time. And wherever you are today in your life, you have gotten there gradually. It has been a series of steps, a series of decisions that have gotten you to the point you are now. What does he say? He expresses the desire to show hospitality to these special guests, these two men. He invites them to have supper with him, to partake of his hospitality, and also to protect them. We're going to find out in verse 8, he talks about the reason he's invited them into his house, to protect them from what could have happened to them in the night if they had stayed in the open square. And he's surprised because they say no. And then he insists strongly, no, you, you don't understand. You need to come in and stay at my house tonight. I read that custom demanded that you must offer strangers a bed for the night. And custom likewise demanded that if you offer, they are supposed to accept. So this would have been a surprise. What do you mean you're not going to come? Sodom knew what happened to strangers in Sodom at night. Says he made them a feast. There aren't as many details. It doesn't seem to be an elaborate feast like they've had for lunch with Abraham, but he's still showing them the hospitality. He's still providing them some food that they ate with him and providing them shelter for the night. Look at verse four. Now, before they lay down, so they've had this meal together and it's before they would retire for the night. We read the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house and they called to Lot. And said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And the New King James puts in italics, adds the word carnally. The men of the city. Look at all those phrases that Moses piles up. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. The ESV has all the people to the last man surrounded the house. Even if Moses is using a literary device of exaggeration, the point is many, many people came together. And as we see, they are wicked. How do I know that? It says, we want you to send out these two guests because we want to know them. And it doesn't always mean this, but often know them or know a person. The Hebrew word underneath that is yada. It means to have sexual relations with. And we'll see from later in this passage, that is the context here. That's what these men intend toward the guests. Now, homosexual practice had become commonplace in Sodom. And it had become commonplace there because apparently it was common among the Canaanites. This is the land of Canaan, the promised land. And here it had gone another step beyond the perversity of homosexuality to sexual assault. Because what we're looking at, if we put it in modern terms, is a homosexual gang rape. It is violence toward these visitors who had come to stay the night with Lot. Now I want to take a moment and talk about God's attitude toward the sin. Of homosexual behavior because you can think what you want to about it our nation obviously recognizes it but what you can't do is say God doesn't care about this or God accepts it or condones it because he doesn't and I'm going to show you a few verses along those lines first off Leviticus 20 verse 13 you're welcome to jot these down I have them on our PowerPoint so that you can see as I read Part of the law that God gave to Moses and he gave to the children of Israel, it says, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So at that time in that place, God made it a capital offense to commit the sin of homosexuality. What is an abomination. It would be good for us to know that. Dictionary definition, it's something that causes disgust. Okay, so what's disgust? A strong feeling of dislike for something that's considered sickening or bad. That's how God feels about the sin of homosexuality. 
Is that the only thing God calls an abomination? No. Frankly, all sin is an abomination to God, but he specifically mentions this one. I'm going to switch over to the New Testament. The New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 1, addresses this same issue. For this reason, God gave him up to vile passions. What does that mean? Vile means wicked. It means very bad or unpleasant. What's a passion? It's a strong feeling or an emotion. Typically, and in this context, it means a strong sexual or romantic feeling for someone. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. I'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 27, likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. This is called shameful. Something that's very bad, something that's bad enough to make someone ashamed. So what about homosexuality being against nature? Let's look at that. Those of you who've been with, our, with us for our study in Genesis, we looked at this weeks ago, months ago. Genesis chapter 1 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created male and female. That was God's idea. That was his design. In the next chapter, it gives more details about the creation of man and the creation of woman. And there we read this statement in Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's a special relationship that God intends for a husband, that's a male, and a wife, that's a female. And it is a one flesh relationship that was part of God's original design, and it is intended to be practiced in marriage. One more passage from the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6 gives a list of sins, and you'll see that homosexuality is one of them in the list. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexual, homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if we were studying that portion of scripture, verse by verse, I would go through and I would define every one of those for you. But we're not. We're going to get back to Genesis. But I want you to understand, that's a list, list of sins. Ways in which we break God's law. That slide that's up right now, thieves, those who steal, covetous. Drunkards, revilers, extortioners. The previous one, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites. That's a list of sins. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I love 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. That's why I used this passage. And such were some of you. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And he says, some of you practiced these sins in the past. But, look at that word, but. You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. There is hope for any type of sin, including this one, because our righteousness is in Jesus Christ and in believing in him as Savior. So let me summarize what I've been saying and maybe clarify a couple of things. All homosexual behavior is sin, according to God's word, not Bob's opinion, according to the word of God. It is sin. It's breaking God's law. Temptation, on the other hand, we would put it as same-sex attraction in modern terminology. Temptation towards sin is not sin. Acting on it is sin. People who remain in homosexual sin are not saved, 
according to Scripture. We just looked at it in 1 Corinthians 6, and there are other passages in Timothy and other places that teach the same thing. Now, different sins have different consequences. But let's understand that homosexuality is not any worse than any other sin. It may not be the particular sin you struggle with, but God sees all sin as sin. And the one sin that would send anyone to hell is unbelief, not believing that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior and Jesus is the Savior. Each statement I just made about homosexual sin is true of heterosexual sin. If you are involved, in heterosexual relationship outside of marriage that is every bit as sinful and it is another indication if you're living in sin never leaving sin never convicted about sin there's a high likelihood that you are not a child of god david guzik put it this way the bible teaches we are all born with a predisposition to sin it shouldn't surprise us that some of the population finds this predisposition expressed in homosexual desire. So that is the wickedness. That is the main sin. We talked a little bit last week. It is not the only sin that was taking place in Sodom, not by any means, but it is the one that they are known for. And it is characteristic of the wickedness that caused God to judge their city. Look at verse 6. So Lot went out to them. That's the crowd that had assembled there, all the men, through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. He says, do not do so wickedly. This shows what's going on and what has been going on probably for years in Lot's life. Peter gives us a clue. If all we had was this account for Genesis, I would not think that Lot was a saved man. But we have what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 2. Let me read verse 7. And God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Did you catch that? Peter tells us three times in those two verses that Lot was righteous. How can that be? What else he says is that Lot was tormented or continually tortured in his righteous soul. So of all of the things we could say against Lot, and probably we will today, he was righteous because he had put faith in a coming Messiah, a God who could forgive sin. And in his soul, his conscience was trained well enough that the sin around him bothered him. He had that going for him. There are some people who profess to be believers around us today, and they are not bothered by sin at all. In fact, they participate. They're more sophisticated. They're not bothered by it. It doesn't matter what they see, what they watch, what they hear. Lot was vexed in his righteous soul, and that's part of and one of the only evidences we have that he was a believer. So he said, tells them, don't do so wickedly. We'll come to their response in a minute. He has what is a horrible idea. He says, I have two daughters. Do whatever you want with them. And it has us scratching our head. And our mouth hanging open. How could someone, especially someone we just said is righteous, do this? That's absurd. We don't know his exact motive. One is that the custom of that time dictated that anyone he was showing hospitality to, he had to give of himself and his family for their protection. I noticed that he does not give of himself. He gives of his family. He gives his daughters. Custom demanded that he place his guest's safety above his own. Instead, he placed their safety above that of his daughters. Verse 9. 
And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one who came to stay here. And he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. This one keeps acting as a judge. There's an implication there that this is not the first time that Lot had spoken out against their sin. But they describe him while he says, brothers, kind of a strange statement for him to make. They resent him as a foreigner who is now making himself a judge over them. Let me share a thought from David Guzik. The men of Sodom thought they were just pursuing pleasure. They did not care that Lot thought what they were doing was wicked. The difference in their standards points to an important question. If we abandon the Bible's guide for sexual morality, what guide for sexual morality will we follow? To simply do as one pleases is not enough. In our modern world, our Western society, there are things that are acceptable as far as morals go, and there are things that are unacceptable. Most people still believe that if you're married, you should be faithful to your spouse. The Bible certainly teaches that. But if we don't have the Bible, if we don't have an, a clear standard, then it's all up for grabs, and it's subject to change, as it has been in the laws of this land. The men, who we know are angels, reached out and pulled Lot into the house. Now, Lot, who said he was protecting them by offering his daughters, they are protecting him. And what do they do? They smite the crowd with blindness. The mob is now blind. And in this chapter that is so sad, one of the saddest statements is that after they're blind and confused by the angels, both small and great became weary trying to find the door. They are still so consumed with their lust that they care less about their eyesight, their vision that they have now lost than fulfilling their desires. That shows us what is going on in Sodom and why God has judged their sin. He knew and he sent the angels in part to verify the reports that he heard, the outcries that we talked about last week. And that brings us to our second point, that God extends mercy. That even when God judges sin, he offers a way of escape. Look at verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Do you have anyone else here? And we looked a little bit at this verse last week to figure out Lot's relatives and why Abraham was asking at least 10 righteous. Would you not destroy the city for 10? But Spurgeon noticed this question. He saw something here that is instructive to us. Have you anyone else here? In other words, are you concerned for others, for their salvation? For your family, for your friends, for your neighbors? Are you concerned for others around you? The great question for us to ask ourselves, have you anyone else here? If God were to condemn, to judge your city, your town today, whom could you go to to say, we got to get out of here. God's going to destroy this city and have them believe you and go with you and be saved. This is the first time it's plainly stated, the Lord has sent us to destroy Sodom. The good news, of course, is that Lot's family could escape. Verse 14, so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. 
So get the picture. It's the middle of the night. There is an angry mob who is blind. They are blind and they are trying to find the door. And Lot, at the instruction of the angels, is going out to try to find whoever he has in the city. Now we know that Lot had at least two sons-in-law because it's written as plural. When Lot went out to talk to them, how far did he have to go? That's a question that occurred to me that has never occurred to me until this weekend when I was studying. Let me ask it a different way. Were his sons-in-law part of the angry mob? If it was all the men of the city, then it's possible all he had to do was find them in the crowd. How did they respond? They thought he was joking. This is an April Fool's joke, right? Not at all. It's God's judgment on wickedness. Bernard McGee said there is many a man today who may be a saved man, but due to his lifestyle or where he lives, he loses his family, his influence, and his testimony. The man may trust Christ, but you would never know it by his life. And it seems that Lot's sons-in-law, because they rejected the opportunity to flee from that wrath that was coming the next morning, lost their lives. They perished. Verse 15. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. You get the picture? Two angels, supernatural creatures, have come and stayed with you. They have protected you. They have made the people outside your door, the angry mob, blind. And now they say, God's going to destroy the city. Get out of here. Go. And what do we read about Lot? Verse 16. And while he lingered, what was he thinking? Were they choosing which of their valuables to take with them? Was he trying to figure out who else he could invite to leave the city with them? Why was he lingering? Why did he not obey right away, as we've seen Abraham do so many times? And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand. These angels, there are two of them, and they are grabbing Lot, his wife, and the other angel has the two daughters, and they are dragging them, holding their hands, bringing them out of the city to safety. Because Lot is lingering. Lingering. Someone said, first Lot lingered, then he argued, and then he begged to allow, be allowed to go his own way. That's verse 18. Then Lot said to them, please, please know, my lords. Indeed now, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, the city, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live, or other translations say, that my life may be saved. Again, can you follow his logic? This man who offered his daughters to the angry mob, this man who is lingering when angels are telling him to flee, is now saying, thank you so much for showing me mercy by getting me out of the city you're going to destroy, but no, I cannot go to the mountains. I cannot follow that order because something bad will happen there. And we shake our heads and we laugh at that. And that is exactly the way we treat God. Yes, God, I know you've saved me from an eternal hell. I know you've saved me from the power of sin and death. But you cannot. I, I can't go there. I know you want me to go there, Lord. I know you told me to go there. I can't go there because I wouldn't be safe there. I can't do that, Lord. I know you're leading me to do that, but I can't do that because I wouldn't be safe there. And that's what Lot is showing us. One more surprise 
is that when he begs to go to that little city, Zoar, which means little or insignificant, the angels say, yes, we're going to allow that too. And God spared Zoar because of righteous lot. It seems from the number of cities that was going to be destroyed that Zoar was going to be one of the cities of the plain that God destroyed. And he spared it for the sake of one righteous man, Lot, because Abraham prayed and asked God not to destroy the righteous. Verse 21, and he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Verse 23, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. They're sobering words, aren't they? The Lord rained brimstone and fire from the Lord out of the heavens. There are various theories. One is that there was an earthquake and that lightning ignited the gases that were released, causing a rain of fire and smoke. That may be what happened. There is a fault line, a rift that goes one fifth of the way around the earth, running north and south through this area. But however it happened, this was judgment from God. And whether he arranged natural processes to help in this destruction, it says the Lord rained fire and brimstone down on the inhabitants of the city and destroyed the vegetation. This is the area that had been described earlier as like the Garden of God. It was like the Garden of Eden. It was beautiful. It was lush. God destroyed all of it. And many Bible scholars believe that this area of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, is now beneath the Dead Sea at the southern end. What we see here are two aspects of God's character. We saw his patience, his willingness to spare a city based on at least 10 people being righteous. And even when he did have to judge the city, there were not even 10 righteous in the city. What do we see? We see his anger unleashed and we still see his mercy. Someone said, as we grow spiritually, we should find ourselves developing a deeper respect for God because of his anger towards sin. And also a deeper love for God because of his patience and because of his mercy when we sin. The sadness is not over yet. Look at verse 26. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Using the information earlier that the angels could not destroy the city until Lot and his family got out, until he had gotten to Zoar. That means that he and the girls had gotten to Zoar while his wife had lagged behind, trailed behind. And what was she? She was looking at the city. She was looking back. She was doing exactly what the angels told her not to do. And it says, in language that's confusing to us, we can't quite picture this, that she turned into a pillar of salt or she was encased by salt and chemicals. However it happened, she died. She died in judgment, the judgment that God was sending on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Well, direct disobedience is punishable, right? But why was she looking? Why was she longing? Why did she stop? I think the best way for us to answer that question is to see what Jesus said about it. And this is a passage you might recognize from the Gospels, from the Gospel of Luke. But I want to look at it in its context to give us the answer of why Lot's wife was punished. This is Luke 17. We're going to read verses 28 to 33. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. This day in the history of Sodom and Gomorrah started off like any other day. 
But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That's what we just read. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Jesus is using this as a lesson. Sodom and Gomorrah is a lesson for our instruction to know that just as suddenly the day of the Lord, the Son of Man will be revealed someday. Verse 31, in that day, the day of the coming of the Lord, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. That three-word sentence in English. Seems to come out of nowhere, doesn't it? And yet he's been talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and how suddenly the destruction came and the judgment came. And he's giving an instruction to the people listening to him in that day. And he says, if you're up on the housetop, do not go back down into the house to get your stuff. And likewise, if you're out in the field, don't turn back to your crops. Remember Lot's wife. And Jesus finished that section by saying, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. What is Jesus saying? What are we saying? Why was she punished? Why was she looking back? She was punished. She was judged because she disobeyed. But why? Because her heart was still in Sodom. Her heart belonged to her stuff. She was connected to the world. We would call it materialism. That's what Jesus said was the reason. And what did Jesus command us to do? Remember Lot's wife. Why? So that you don't do the same thing. Look at verse 27. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. The smoke of a furnace. The sun was up. Abraham went to the same place he had talked with God the, the day before, probably in the afternoon. And what did he see? He saw smoke. And he knew that there had not been at least 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah because God had judged the city. And what had never occurred to me until I studied it this week, Abraham didn't have the chapter. Abraham didn't have cable news or the internet to tell him, oh, but there were survivors that Lot and his family had escaped, he didn't know. I don't know how long it took him to find out. But we read what Moses put, starting in verse 28, verse 29, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. God remembered Abraham. Specifically, God remembered Abraham's request of him. And Abraham had interceded for the righteous, which in her, his mind were Lot and his family. And God spared them when he punished the city. This comes back to that big question last week. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer is yes. God always does right. And while this is a heavy chapter and sobering to read of God's judgment, God is doing right. He extended mercy. He allowed Abraham and his troops to rescue the king of Sodom. Sodom saw the exchange between Melchizedek and Abraham. And nothing changed. That city went right on in its sin and wickedness. No repentance, no change as God extended the deadline and, and waited until the fullness of their iniquity demanded judgment come. He saved a lot. Kent Hughes said, and righteous Lot, conflicted and compromised as he was, was saved not on his own merits, but through grace affected by Abraham's intercession because God remained just and the justifier of all those who come to him. 
God is righteous in punishing wickedness. And God is merciful in providing a way of escape, in providing salvation from judgment. To be perfectly honest, I would feel like this story was bad enough if it ended there, but it doesn't end there either. We have one more point to discuss, and it has to do with Lot's family. Who's left in Lot's family? His wife has died because she stayed back. He has himself and his two daughters that are unmarried. And it said earlier, they had not known a man. They were virgin daughters. And the point I'd like us to see in these verses is that loving the world may cost you your family. Let's look together at verse 30. Then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Whatever else we know about Lot, he was a fearful man. He was not courageous, it does not seem, by any means. And here, we went from, no, angels, no, don't make me go to the mountains. I need to stay in a city, to he's fearful, so he left Zohar and went to the mountains. What happened? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. It is possible that the people there in Zoar thought that he was responsible for the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, that he was the culprit, kind of like the story of Jonah, that he was the reason for the storm. That could be, maybe. It's also possible that being in the city, he felt like, what if there's another storm of fire? What if there's another earthquake? Maybe he's afraid and he goes to a cave for that reason. Whatever the reason, he and his daughters are now living in the mountains in a cave. Verse 31. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both daughters of Lot, were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. Like father, like daughters. If we go back to, I don't know, chapter 13 or so, when Lot first saw Sodom and decided to move towards Sodom, and that's where he decided to settle, in a house in Sodom. We don't have any record that he asked God's opinion, that he prayed, that he asked Abraham for some wisdom. Instead, he said, that looks good, I'll do that. In the same way, we don't have any account here that Lot's daughters looked to God to solve their problem. John Corson said they simply came to their own immoral, irrational decisions. Now, here's the sad irony to all this. They got him drunk, and drunk Lot carried out with his daughters what he had told the men of Sodom they could do with his daughters. And some would like to defend these girls that maybe they really thought that there were no other men in the world who would be their husbands. Okay, if they grew up in Sodom and they didn't know any better, why did they have to get Lot drunk? You could have just asked him. They knew it was wrong. They knew they had to get him drunk in order to cooperate with this plan that they had hatched. And some people want to look at Lot and say, it wasn't his fault. He, he was drunk. He didn't even remember it. That's true. He was drunk. He didn't remember it. But that doesn't let him off the hook. He was still guilty. 
alcohol is not an excuse. If I get drunk and go commit a crime, I'm still responsible for my actions, and so was he. What does this come down to? He chose many years before to move into Sodom, a wicked place. He chose to bring up his family there. He chose really not to have any difference in himself and the people around him, not to make a stand against the wickedness, not to leave that place. And it cost him his family. Moab and Ben Ami, who are Lot's sons and grandsons, were the products of this incest. And they became the fathers of two nations, Moab and Ammon, who became some of Israel's greatest enemies. Let me share with you what Kent Hughes said about it. Lot's immortal folly was this. Though the worldliness of Sodom vexed his righteous soul, he lived as close to the world as he could, hanging on to it for dear life until the bitter end. And the result was that though God judged all of Sodom except Lot and his daughters, Sodom was reborn in their very lives. So we see that it's possible for believing people like us who are truly distressed by the course of this world to live lives that are so profoundly influenced by culture that Sodom is reborn in the lives of those we love the most. What are we supposed to do with this dark, disgusting chapter of Scripture? One of my commentaries said, the lesson is quite clear. It is dangerous and folly to become attached to the present corrupt world system because it awaits God's swift and sudden destruction, which is absolutely true. But as we close this sermon, I'd like to take a little bit more positive approach for those who are not believers in Jesus Christ, who have never turned to God to save them. See, at the outset, I shared with you a quote by Warren Wearsby. Abraham was the friend of God. Lot was the friend of the world. That's true. Abraham was the friend of God. Lot was the friend of the world. But here's the good news. Jesus is the friend of sinners. We can't lose sight of that. This chapter is a glimpse into the sin of unbelievers and the sin of believers. And it's all ugly. And if you were grossed out by the sin that we've been reading about, good. Because it begins to let us see how God sees our sin. And the best news I can offer you is that God did not leave us in our sin. Because he provided a way of salvation. Jesus is the friend of sinners. We read the description how he ate with tax collectors who were the scum of the earth of that day. And he ate with prostitutes. The social outcasts, the sinners of that day, he loved them. He was their friend. He offered them salvation through his shed blood. Because Jesus is the Son of God, and he came to earth and lived a perfect, sinless life. He is the only human who has ever lived who has not sinned at all. And yet, the religious leaders hated him, and they arranged for him to be crucified, executed, hung on a cross. And do you know why? so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for sin. The wages of sin is death. Sin requires a death. And in our case, Jesus died for us. If you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Savior of your sins, you can put your faith in him and receive forgiveness, receive cleansing from his shed blood. He died in our place. He rose again the third day in power. God raised him up, resurrected him. That is the good news. Sin is ugly. But God and his plan of salvation are beautiful. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to understand something. This is an application for you. Your proximity to the world and its culture will show up in your family. That's not to say that every wayward child is a product of a worldly parent. But check your heart. 
You cannot love the world and love God at the same time, period. And you can't love the world without it affecting your family. First John 2, 15 and 17 that I read at the beginning says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Would you pray with me? Our Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for providing salvation from whatever sin we have committed. Thank you for the warning of Lot's wife. Thank you for the warning of Lot and his daughters. May we be changed by that truth today. That we would not stumble and fall into the same traps. Lord, you are holy. You are the judge of all the earth and you always do right. And you must judge sin. But thank you for providing a way of escape. Thank you for providing salvation in Jesus so that we do not have to bear the punishment for our sin. Thank you for doing that in our place. Lord, if there's anyone who is listening or watching who has never done that, has never put faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, may today be the day of salvation for that one. And for any believer who is a carnal Christian like Lot, who is trying to be as close to and as closely associated with the world as possible, May this be a day of repentance and turning back to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening and watching today. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us if we can serve you in any way. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to share. You can do so here on Facebook. You can go to our website and contact us by calling or texting the phone number there or emailing us. However we can serve you, we would love to do so. I'd like to leave you with this thought from Philippians as we go today. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.